In this video, let's look at the slightly unusual but very cool GTEC A20M. I want this to be a non-boring look at the printer for people who are thinking of buying it, or maybe people who are just interested in it, so this will be a quicker than your standard unbox and build video. But let me know in the comments what you think about the style, because I personally can't stand sitting through long build videos, but maybe that's just me. Anyway, if you've already seen my video here, you will know that I picked this printer up with my own money, for around half price in the Black Friday sales at Banggood, which is how I would recommend buying it as it's very expensive at the normal price. This is notably not a new printer, in fact it's been out since at least May 2019, but it seems to have flown under the radar to some extent, probably for various reasons that are not related to its main feature. It can print in two colours. Many printers can print in two colours by means of two separate hotends, but this one has a special hotend with two inputs and one output and some clever stuff inside that allows that to work. There are two models in this lineup, the A10 and A20, both of which come in one, two and three colour versions, with a M for the two colour and a T for the three colour, which is slightly confusing, but okay. Going off the headline features of this printer quickly, it's a Bowden printer, meaning the extruder isn't on the hot end. There's a heated bed, which is slightly larger than an Ender 3, at 250mm build size in all three dimensions, so that's basically a cube you can build uh, 25 centimeters in every side. The max hot end temperature is around 240 degrees Celsius. It states a higher temperature, but with it having a non-all metal hot end, it's a bad idea to go above about 240. There's a four-line LCD display, and the nozzle is 0.4mm, so everything is pretty standard aside from the two colour functionality. Let's get into the box then. You get a manual, but I'm going to be brutally honest here, I didn't actually like it. It felt like, mostly other than skim reading it at the start, it wasn't really very helpful. You're actually better off figuring out what goes where yourself, especially if you've previously built another printer of this style, like an Ender 3 for example. The printer does come mostly assembled too, compared to an Ender 3 or an Ender 3 V2. This is the frame, it's already put together, and for mine it didn't really, really require any calibration. For example, the belt was okay out of the box. It's nice to see even the Z screw is already installed, as that's something a lot of people struggle with setting up on enders. This bed though is a bit disappointing. I understand the printer initially came with a coated glass bed for earlier versions, but it seems like they've cheaped out with this sticker thing. It works okay, but I don't like it. Annoyingly, it's an odd size too, so getting a glass bed is a challenge, if it's at all possible for a coated glass bed of this size. Please comment below if you know anywhere that sells coated glass beds of this size, because I couldn't find any when I searched. And this is essentially the rest of the printer. The base is pretty robust with a metal case. It's well built and it's not cheaped out on, although notably the screen lights up when you move the bed, which is not uncommon, but I'm still not sure why we haven't fixed this yet. It seems like something that shouldn't be happening in 2021, but okay. So all you need to do here is screw the frame onto the bottom through the two holes in the base. Of course, I couldn't just do that without losing the screws into the base box, but every mistake is an opportunity. So while I did have to waste another 15 minutes removing the bottom of the printer to get into it to get my two screws back, we do get a look at the board and the screen in the process. As a side note, if you're actually assembling one of these yourself, it's easier to not lose the screws inside by having something to balance the frame on. This Creality Glass bed box was the perfect size. I realise not everyone has one of these, but that's the kind of size you're looking for. The board itself has an 8-bit Atmega chip with soldered on drivers that appear to be nothing special, then not silent or anything. Here's the PSU specs if you're interested in that. I also had to remove the LCD too, annoyingly, to get my last screw back. I really suggest not dropping the screws inside the case in case you didn't already get that idea. Once back together though, the next thing you have to do is put the Bowden extruders onto the top of the frame. They're a bit of an odd design to me, being more used to the squarish ones that you tend to see elsewhere. They're a bit like the BMG style ones I guess, they're geared down in that way. They should work well in theory, but a lot of people seem to have a problem with them. Anyway, they go on the frame with these normal turny nutty things. After that, the spool holders go on. You have to use the front two holes, ignoring the back one, that would be for mounting it sideways, you know, 90 degrees on. I don't actually like this setup much. It makes it quite tricky to thread the filament in, and that's an understatement. It's especially the right-hand extruder for some reason, because you can't you can't get your thumb in to press the lever. I'm, yeah, it's possible that I haven't got this set up quite right, but the instructions are not much help. We'll get onto the filament runout sensor part in the moment as well. This thing here is a strain relief sort of setup for the hot end wires, I think. Nicely, all the hot end wires are in one plug block, so once you've added this part, you're just plugging the whole lot in. Then you're supposed to zip tie it all to the to that strain relief 
part that you've just put on, which I guess also stops the plug from coming out while the hot end is moving around. This all seems okay so far. The printer also comes with some levelling paper, which was useful as one leg was slightly shorter than the other on the printer's base. It's nice of them to think of that, isn't it? Finally, it's just a case of plugging in the various wires and also noticing that the Z-Limit sensor was really hard to plug in. Everything else was very much like just building an Ender 3, including the X-axis wiring, which was almost identical. Now, the filament sensors, they're supposed to go on with these screws here, and it's not too hard to work out how. I think maybe you should put some tube here, because I've seen some pictures of people, but I, I didn't bother. Uh, either way, something like this. My model, for reasons unknown, did not come with an SD card, and I'm sure I've seen reviews of other people who, whose models didn't come with SD cards either, so this made initial tests even harder than usual, as I had no test models to, you know, normally what you do is you build a printer and you'd use the G-code on the SD card to check it's working. This was a bit annoying, as it meant I couldn't test anything until I'd set up Cura. Luckily though, Cura has a profile built in for the A20M, so it was pretty easy to get to that point. Add an SD card with some G-code on, and you can do some mixing in the firmware using the on-screen menus to test both sides of the nozzle. It's all good, and again, you may have seen the result in the other video. If all you want to do is gradients on mixers or manual colour changes using the menus, then you never have to worry about extruder settings on this printer, but of course you probably will want to, because why else would you buy this printer? So I'll cover it very briefly here. The A20M profile comes set up with two extruders, and the menus in Cura will look slightly different due to there being two tabs tabs, one for each extruder, and it's worth noting that some settings seem to be shared across both tabs, while others aren't, and that takes a bit of getting used to. I haven't really yet myself, you change something for one extruder and you've got to change it for the other, like temperature for example. There's also a dual extrusion section, which is the main thing you need to look at for this printer. Uh, you'll almost certainly realise on your first multicolour print that the dual extrusion settings just don't work well for this printer. I've linked below to a profile that I've managed to make based on some help for a user on our Discord channel, and this is how I managed to get a decent print, as you can see here. The long and short of it was that the retraction and purge lengths on this printer have to be really quite huge to get good results. And that, I guess, brings me to my feelings on this printer. I know other YouTubers have previously reviewed and played with this printer, and generally the consensus is that it's not a beginner printer. I both agree and disagree with this point. There's intrinsically nothing hard about this printer in terms of building it or using it. But at the same time, I'm glad that this is not my only printer, and that's because of a few aspects. It is noisy, it strings badly without using the high retraction settings, it's a pain to load compared to other printers, the build plate is an odd size, I'm even going to complain about the levelling wheels underneath that are too small. But on the flip side, it does work. I've not tried it with anything but PLA yet, and I'm dreading trying TPU on it to be honest, but I have had very little problems with it so far on PLA. It hasn't blocked, surprisingly, and the print quality is actually very good. Even at higher print speeds, I think the print quality actually tops the Ender 3, which may not come as a surprise to some of you, but I think the Ender 3 is a pretty good printer. Single colour printing is fine too, and there is a potential solution I've not yet looked into for the size of the purge tower, which is a thing called a purge bucket, which I may cover in the future. Of course, purging is also a constant amount per layer, meaning that if you print 10 of something multicoloured, it will purge the same amount as printing one. So this means that one small two-colour model is actually the most wasteful way to print on this particular style of printer. And do remember that you have the firmware-based mixing too, which doesn't waste any filament, and it can give some astounding results as I've already covered. So I guess that's about as close to a balanced review as you're going to get. My advice? Buy it as a second or third printer, or buy it with a view to also get a cheap Ender 3 or something to run alongside it. It is definitely a good printer, and it's well built, but you will almost certainly, before too long, wish you had another one. I'm absolutely sure of that. Anyway, that's about all I wanted to say, so thank you for watching. As usual, please comment below. Uh, also, please consider subscribing, joining us on Discord. Links are all below in the description. Thank you for watching.